So what is sigmoid function? So as I already explained to you, we need to get the values in the range 0 to 1. Now let's have a look at the graph of sigmoid function. Right? As I explained, this is uh, that drawing was really horrible. Uh, this looks much better. So you, this is how a sigmoid curve looks like. So you can clearly see it's bounded between 0 and 1. The maximum value it can go up till at even at infinity is 1. And the minimum value it can go down to is 0. The midline value which is basically is y equals to 0.5 happens at x equals to 0, right? Uh, so this is an equation for sigmoid uh, which is 1 by 1 plus epsilon to the power minus z. 1 by 1 plus epsilon to the power minus z. So this is called gz or sigmoid of z as you would call it. Uh, now try and get this intuition y g so minus infinity and what happens at minus infinity at minus infinity e to the power minus z right e to the power minus infinity would go towards zero so now let's have a look into sigmoid so as i was explaining sigmoid is given by gz equals to one by epsilon to the power one plus epsilon to the power minus z uh, this is also called sigmoid of z g of z however you call it right so what happens as so let's write that down g of z equals to 1 by epsilon to the power minus z now what happens at minus infinity at minus infinity this is 1 by epsilon to the power infinity and epsilon to the power infinity would be infinity so 1 plus infinity and this is 1 by infinity which is roughly equals to 0 what happens to g at positive infinity so that is 1 by epsilon to the power minus infinity uh, what happens to 1 plus epsilon to the power minus infinity that is 1 plus 0 which is 1 by 1 almost so 1 by 1 which is equals to 1 right so you can clearly see at minus infinity the value is 0 as it goes towards minus infinity the value is 0 and at plus infinity the value is 1 right so no matter what value z takes, the final value is always is range between 0 and 1, right? So minus infinity to plus infinity doesn't matter. It's an S curve which looks like this and its maximum value is 1, minimum value is 0, right? So there are simple modifications now that we do sigmoid exactly. So now what we are going to do is take our linear regression and just modify it simply, right? So in our linear regression, our prediction looks like this, right? Y equals to theta naught plus theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 and so on and so forth right so instead of that in case of logistic regression how would our predictions looks like it would be 1 by y epsilon to the power minus theta naught theta 1 x1 plus theta naught and theta naught x theta n x n right now this particular value could take any continuous value right we know that this is a problem we had with linear regression being used for classification because this particular thing can take up any continuous value but once we do a sigmoid of this particular thing right so even though this particular equation can take up any continuous value this particular y hat prediction is only lying between 0 and 1 right so your this was a linear regression this was linear regression and this is a logistic regression right so what did we do here this is the only two, this is the first tweak that we do here which is from linear regression to logistic regression. In case of linear regression, you were trying to fit a straight line through all of them. In case of logistic regression, we are going to try and fit an S curve. And how are we going to do exactly that? We are going to take the same predictions, right? The, everything remains same from linear regression. You have got theta naught, theta 1, theta 2 and all of that. And what we are going to do is y equals to 1 by epsilon to the power minus the same thing. Now this particular equation can take any continuous value, which is fine with us this is fine right as long as this final prediction is lying between 0 and 1 and we know that would obviously be the case because your y prediction as we know z whatever be this value this would always be between 0 and 1 right so now let's understand what this final number that came out of all of this what does this actually represent yeah so now let's understand what is this particular continuous number that came out from the sigma function what does it even physically represent to understand that that's nothing but very simply put uh, these are particular classes right so each individual so this there's, there's a there's a tumor there's a tumor that could be benign and malignant so what does this particular for any given x value what is this continuous number indicate right so this continuous number is nothing but the probability of this particular data point this particular data point belonging to class 1 
right as you can clearly see if it's a something which is closer to the closer to the data points that you already have this probabilities are higher right as your x increases this probability increases and tends to go towards one right and as the probability kind of you kind of come towards this side you see the probability of it going to this particular class one is zero almost tending towards zero which is exactly what we know right if your probability of it belonging to class one is zero that means probability of it belonging to class zero is the highest so that is exactly what this is so this is nothing but probability of it belonging to class one right so this particular continuous number that you get out of this so this y hat y hat is nothing but the probability of this particular class data point for whichever data point you are measuring right so for any given data point you can calculate this given the x1 x2 values right uh, if you have fitted your logistic regression you would get your theta naught and theta 1 values and given any new data point you can calculate the y prediction values right so y prediction that continuous number that comes out of it is nothing but basically the probability of that particular data point this particular whichever data point you are testing on the probability of that particular data point belonging to class 1 that's all about it so for example if in current case if your say prediction comes out to be 0 0.7 right what that does mean that means that tumor has a 70 percent probability of being malignant malignant was a positive class class one right so that's exactly what it is i have already explained you so the final prediction that you get from the sigmoid right the sigmoid gives you a continuous number right between zero to one that continuous number represents the probability of that particular class belonging to a positive class in this case tumor we are a positive class is malignant so if the final sigma number comes out to be 0.7 we say that it has got a 70 percent probability of being malignant which means it has got a 30 percent probability of being benign right which is class zero so probability of class one is basically nothing but one minus probability of class zero right so now let's try and understand decision boundary with this given that now we are not going to use a straight line but we are going to use a decision we are going to use a s curve right so the concept of decision boundary has not changed yet right the decision boundary is still that particular line which separates your positive from your negative predictions and we are going to try and see how that decision boundary looks in case of a sigmoid curve because earlier when we did it we tested it for a linear regression line right so it was a straight line that's not what we are going to use for logistic regression so let, let's see how it looks like how decision boundary looks like in case of logistic regression so so yeah in this case let's again let's reconstruct this thing it's totally very messy right now yeah so now you had this is a particular example you had multiple dots which is y equals to zero these are your benign tumors and these are your malignant tumors right so y equals to one so now and you fit a s curve which looks like this right so the decision boundary is basically the same concept right it's basically that particular point in x which separates your negative predictions from your positive predictions right so how do you find that uh, so first we have to decide how to deal with this continuous number right so it's very easy the same way we dealt with the continuous number from linear regression we are going to say that okay if y hat which is nothing but the probability of belonging to class 1 is greater than 0.5 then class is predicted class is 1 if probability of 1 is less than equals to 0.5 then the predicted class is 0 right it's the same thing that we had done earlier right so because 0.5 seems a rational number right uh, though keep in mind this then this is a very important concept please keep in mind 0.5 is definitely a rational threshold but definitely not something that you would use always yes yeah, so, so one thing to keep in mind is that 0.5 is a rational threshold but not a definitely a, a mandatory threshold or a compulsory threshold that doesn't mean that every problem you need to have 0.5 as threshold and as we kind of go through the all the lectures of data science throughout the course throughout the next lecture sessions we'll be able to appreciate that much better that why 0.5 is not necessarily the correct threshold for every problem but for now for simplicity 0.5 definitely seems a rational threshold between 0 and 1 it's midway so the concept still is going to be same right so if you're going to because your threshold now you have selected as 0.5 you're going to draw the line and see where it meets your prediction curve 
and what is that value right because for every value on left of this you're gonna see the predictions and the prediction is gonna be less than 0.5 so it's a negative class right whereas for everything on the right of it it would be a positive class right because the predictions would be greater than 0.5 so the concept of decision boundary has not changed it's just that how you instead of a straight line it's a s curve out here right so that's all about it so now let's try and get a mathematical idea of what this looks like right so y hat equals to 1 by epsilon to the power minus theta naught plus theta 1x right so for in this particular case right so this is the two dimensional case there's just 1x so when we say that basically that value of x for which that value of x for which y hat equals to 0.5 what is the corresponding value of x right that is the one which we need right so what do we know what we know that sigmoid value basically is 0.5 so this sigmoid value right the prediction value is 0.5 when you're corresponding this particular thing right so y hat if you're so sorry g of z equals to 1 by epsilon to the power minus z we know that g of z equals to 0.5 if z equals to 0 right so we know that if y hat looks like this then y hat would be 0.5 if this particular term is equals to 0 right so theta naught plus theta 1 x equals to 0 that is the point when we know that if this is 0 then the final sigmoid function this y prediction would be 0.5 right from this particular thing so then we know x equals to minus theta naught by theta 1 so that whatever that particular point be so this particular point right x d is nothing but this particular value right so this particular value is what is your x d here so that is the intuition of decision boundaries from one dimension now let's try and understand intuition decision boundaries on a two dimension data right uh, mathematically how would it look like so now in case of two dimension your final equation would look like something like this right minus theta 1 plus theta 1 x 1 plus theta 2 x 2 so in this case again we know y hat would be equals to 0 0.5 if this particular term is equal to 0 now this particular equation if it is 0 what does that mean so this is equals to 0 right so this is the equation of a straight line right so if you plot x 1 and x 2 so this is how does this equation look like right so it says x2 equals to minus theta naught by theta 2 minus theta 1 by theta 2 x1 right so this is y equals to mx plus c so if you plot a line which is between x1 and x2 you would see that this is a straight line right so straight line and this basically we know that this is the we already know decision boundary is the concept of decision boundary is that it separates your positive from your negative examples right so if you these are your positive uh, these are your negative it could be the other way around this could also be positive this could also be negative doesn't matter what we know is that in case of two dimension the decision boundary would look like a straight line right that is something we already understand from this particular equation this is the equation of a straight line it would be equals to zero so this would be your intercept and this is the slope of that particular line right so this sorry this is x2 and this is x1 right so x2 in terms of x1 looks like this right c plus mx so c plus mx so then you plot it it would look like a straight line so that is exactly something we would expect when it's a two dimension case right so in this two dimension case as you can clearly see these are your pos some positive examples and these are said negative examples so we would expect the line to be exactly passing between this right in case of one dimension as you can clearly see when we had this particular thing right so we had malignant tumors here sorry benign tumors and malignant tumors we are plot plotting y versus x and we saw in that it was a straight line right this is a straight horizontal line right in this case please note that we are seeing a straight line but this is not y versus x these are the two independent features right in this case x was the independent feature and y was the dependent feature right and we plotted y versus x and that was a straight line right but if you see in x that's just a point right in x if just in x that's a simple point right this is in case of x2 and x1 that's a straight line right you can really under please make this difference clear this is y versus x plot and you saw that was a straight line this is x2 versus x1 which are the two independent features right so now you can clearly see as i was explaining you can see positive and negative examples and they are separated by a straight line because we saw 
uh, in case of two dimension the decision boundary looks like a straight line so now the next question is can you have it was a straight line can you have a non-linear decision boundary can you have a decision boundary which is not a straight line so let's first understand what we are trying to do we are basically trying to say uh, if this is how your problem looks like so you have your all your positive examples like this and you have a negative examples like this can your logistic regression come up with something like this can it come up uh, intuitively you might think that probably it may or may not be but let's check it out mathematically is it possible to do or not so for us so we know that what we want is something like this so this is x2 and this is x1 and we want x2 and this is x1 and we know that what we want is something like this something like a this circle right so something which looks like this so this is a decision boundary you want it right so we know that what is a decision boundary it's basically nothing but that particular point where this thing out here is equal to zero right so if whatever term here is if that term is equal to zero then we know that for and we are using 0.5 as threshold please keep me, remember this this heuristic that we are using to make this zero right that is only valid for 0.5 as threshold if you have something other threshold it might not hold might not be as straightforward as what we are doing here right so what we know is if this particular point this value is 0.5 the threshold that we are using and for that we basically know that we need this particular thing above here right to be zero so now and we know that if this is zero this is basically the equation that kind of derives our linear regression right so sorry this is the uh, if this is zero this is the one which kind of uh, defines our decision boundary so for a non-linear case to have something like this so equation of this kind of a decision this kind of an equation right so we saw that equation of a straight line was something like theta naught plus theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 equals to 0 this was straight line now what does the same thing look for circle the same thing for circle looks like something like theta 1 x1 square plus theta 2 circle or ellipse whatever you call it would look something so equation for us ellipse would look something like this circle slash ellipse would look like something like this right so what we are trying to get here is uh, can we have basically something like this here right if we can have something like this here then we know that whenever this particular term goes to zero then this particular thing would go to 0.5 and that's basically gonna be the defining line right which separates our positive and negative so is this possible the answer is yes very much possible right because there's nothing that stops us from doing this it's like it, instead of using x1 you're just using x1 square that's just another new independent feature because just because you're squaring or anything doesn't make any difference right you can square it cube it take a square root take a log transform it's just another new independent feature right so ideally you can do this completely so there's nothing problem with this so the pro thing to kind of take home from this is this kind of non-linear decision boundaries are absolutely possible depending on the kind of features that you choose so probably you're finding this very similar to the linear regression lecture that we had where we had used polynomial features and i tried modeling non-linear relationships right so these are non-linear relationships between x2 and uh, x1 but even with using my polynomial features like x1 square x2 square we have been able to model this right so that's exactly something i have told you now let's try and understand the final bit of it which is how does sklearn work on logistic regression in api right so the data set we are using is still the same data set that we had used for uh, malignancy versus benign classification uh, now the only way one only thing that you have done and it's very simple and very similar to the linear regression api you first call the logistic regression model and then you pass dot fit x comma y right it's absolutely the same same pattern that we have followed through entire lectures of linear regression and environment two there's nothing much difference in the api as such so we first make a toy data set which we have used which we have made using make classification and now we are implementing that and we do a dot fit now we plot this thing and see how this looks like right now you can clearly see our decision boundary it's almost looking like an s curve it's not an exact x curve because we are taking a lot of values if you take a closer look within say minus one to one 
you would tend to see there's a slight curve associated with this or probably within say minus 0.5 to plus 0.5 if you look at this curve uh, this is roughly an s curve so it's just because you have taken a lot of values that it has decompressed and is now looking like a step wise function so obviously now you can see that if you have a 0.5 as threshold you would have zero as your decision boundary right so now let's try and observe and add an outline and see how it goes so we are going to do the same thing right for class number class one we are going to add a new benign tumor of size 20 so not benign, benign. we are going to add a malignant tumor right we are going to add a positive class uh, positive class at x size equals to 20 and let's see how that kind of affects now you clearly see again we have done the same thing we have done the dot fit thing and we have plotted everything and now you see that again the interesting thing to note about this is in earlier case when we were using linear regression our decision boundary had shifted right in this case you can clearly see the decision boundary has not shifted which is a great thing right this is what we wanted in the starting we wanted our model whatever we were building to be robust to outliers linear regression was definitely not it was trying to fit a line through all of them hence it was not but now you try and fit an s curve through them you see that it's working perfectly fine so obviously this is much more suitable for classification so now the idea is can we use uh, pipeline features right polynomial features to make our models even more better so now let's see that so we have done we are going to take some prediction data set which is a loan prediction data set which basically contains the data set the one that john was keen about whether he would get a loan or not and before we kind of do that uh, let me try and show you what your what does the data look like so your data looks like this right you have got your applicant income co-applicant income loan amount loan amount term credit history and loan status so loan status is a thing that we are concerned about this is the thing that we want to predict and this are this is my y and these are my other independent features right so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and fit a logistic regression. I could directly try and fit as it is, but in this case, we are trying to see and use polynomial features so as to make our model learn. We had seen in linear regressions, right? The more you added complex features, more polynomial features, our model tend to learn better, right? So we are going to do the same thing. We are going to try fitting using polynomial features instead of just applicant income, applicant income square and all of that, right? so we are going to do all of that uh, so just understand this just this classification problem this is one zero this is your y that you want to do and this all five columns are your x so now you do that and you try and print accuracy you get an accuracy out of 0.729 right yeah so now you finally do the fit and train and you see that we have gained an accuracy score of 0.77 this means of all the cases in that particular data set of loan prediction 77 percent of those cases we could predict accurately which is a great achievement to start up with right so now let's try and understand how can we do that better log on to gray adams learning platform to unlock more free content subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates